you may not be the greatest declaimer in the world, and Francis, you are, having <laughs> toured America for the English-speaking union um, in a debating series. David, I pay tribute to you as one of the finest journalists I have ever known. And I back this up by saying that you were the first journalist I ever knew. Because although I'm now shadowing Peter Mandelson in the House of Lords, Peter and I have a previous career in that we ran the British Youth Council. And whenever we wanted to get a leak through to someone who knew how to utilize it, in those days, <laughs> Peter and I rang up David Henke. Now that's in the 70s. So I don't know what all this on this press release is about you've been there since 1986. I can testify he goes back much further than that. But I do compliment him on really putting the record straight. A lot of nonsense has been written about the miners' strike, particularly, I'm afraid, by Ian McGregor. And Peter Walker and I had a lot to put up with during the strike, and most of it came, most of the real difficult situations came from Ian McGregor. And I commend the book to you in putting that bit of the record straight, and Francis, you are to be congratulated as well. I should explain what, how I entered this situation. About halfway through the strike, NACODs, the deputies, had said that they were going to go out on strike. There was a huge problem. Scargill had just appeared with Ian McGregor on Channel 4 and had sought to walk out halfway through and had been told by the interviewer to get back in his seat. And I think people generally thought it was all up and lost. And then there'd been a secret meeting on the Sunday when Ian McGregor had ill-advisedly put a paper bag over his head and said to all the journalists, you're not supposed to be here, this is a secret meeting. And all the newspapers on that Monday morning had carried this picture of Ian McGregor with a basket over his, a real basket case. And there, there was I sitting in Conservative Central Office. I'd had some difficult jobs. I'd been with um, uh, John Knott, uh, not only through the abolition of exchange controls and all those, Price Commission, but also through the Falklands. And I'd been, I suppose, to some extent recognized by being made vice chairman of the Conservative Party, and I was interviewing, I think, Sarah Keyes at the time, who you, you may never have heard of. <laughs> uh, she's written a book, and I actually occupy a full chapter of that book, chapter six, which is her interview with me. And she records this call, and I remember this call vividly, because it was from Margaret Thatcher. And this voice said to me, uh, David, I want you to become Minister for Coal. Given the backdrop to this, I thought it was John Gummer just down the corridor playing a trick on me. Because it was the job, it was the job that no one in their right mind would have wanted. And I sort of said, no, oh, Prime Minister, that's very kind of you. When would you like me to start? And she said, six o'clock. And I knew it was Margaret Thatcher then. And of course, <laughs> John Gummer's never quite as precise as that. Um, no, no, I never said that. Neil, um, well, all I will say is that uh, I got to the Department of Energy, met Peter Walker, and Peter said, we're under pressure to reassure the nation. And Nicholas Witchell wants you to go on the nine o'clock news. So I said, well, you know, I'm not really properly briefed. And he said, well, just go on and reassure the nation. So I sat, <laughs> I sat um, all, alongside Nicola, Nicholas Witchell on the, the national news, and he turned to me and he said, David, we've just heard that right across the nation there are worried pensioners, people are fearing power cuts, vulnerable people are exposed. Can you assure the nation that there will be no power cuts this winter? And I said, yes. Nicholas, I will use every moment at my disposal, every power I have, to make sure there are no power cuts. I went back and I saw the officials and I told them what I'd said because they hadn't watched, they'd been at dinner or something. And, and they said, you said what? You said what? You've got a lot of work to do. And I think that was, for me, the minor strike because 
the Nottinghamshire miners were still working. I was then very fully briefed. I'm afraid miner had been set against miner, community against community. It was very much a strike that should never have been allowed to happen, and there's a lot in the, the book about that. And it was a, a tragic time. But I became aware soon that there was a very good offer on the table. The offer was that everyone who wanted to carry on working in the coal industry would be guaranteed a job, the highest redundancy benefits in Western Europe, a new independent colliery review procedure, and an enterprise scheme to bring new jobs to mining areas. So it was a, it was a good offer. But uh, Ian McGregor had never got that across. And so my first job was to seek out a new spokesperson who could talk for the coal industry. And Ian McGregor strongly opposed that. But the wonderful man, Michael Eaton, came into view. He sadly just died. But I remember meeting Michael for the first time. And he said, David, the one thing you've got to understand about Arthur Scargill is he is very difficult to, uh, to, to negotiate with because he never, in seven years, he was director of the Yorkshire area. In seven years, I've never been able to reach a negotiated settlement with Arthur Scargill. It's always with those around him. And Michael Eden then became the spokesperson. Ian McGregor fought this at every, every pillar and post. But Michael Eden and I sat down and we worked out how we could make sure there were never any power cuts. Now, of course, the reason for the strike was said to be no pit closures on economic grounds. I think, Neil, you suggested it might be better saying on commercial rather than economic. But whatever was the reason for the strike, there hadn't been a ballot under Rule 43. We debated it many times in the House of Commons. Meanwhile, people started to come back to work. And we reached an agreement with NACODS, which I think was a very fair agreement. And we then, Peter Walker then stood up in the House of Commons on the 19th of November 1984 and said the NACODS agreement is available to the NUM and to Arthur Scargill. And we had lots of debates, Neil, you may remember. And there then started, Ian McGregor started to insist there should be a written undertaking associated with um, the NACODS agreement that he would only deal with Arthur Scargill if he signed a written undertaking. And eventually, it went through Christmas, people kept returning to work, and we had another debate in the House of Commons. This was on the 4th of February, 1985. And I then made it absolutely clear to the Commons that no written agreement was required. All Arthur Scargill had to do was to agree to the NACODS agreement. And Neil, I don't know whether you recall this, but you turned to those alongside you and said, is this new? Is this new? And it was new. It was new. But meanwhile, we, we were meeting Norman Willis, the unsung hero, and his colleagues from the TUC, and we were trying to reach agreement, and they said they would recommend this behind the scenes to Arthur Scargill, but he never accepted it. The strike went on, and even at the last moment, as the book reveals that meeting, 11-11, he would not cast his casting vote to stop the strike. But eventually the miners resisted those pressures and walked back to work, those who were still on strike, with dignity. That's the abiding impression I have. I should just mention in conclusion that I've still got the Sun headline, which just had one word, defeat, and had Arthur Scargill, not his most beautiful picture, Mick McGarhy with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And I reckon it was, it was a defeat for that political strike which Arthur had started. And that's always been my view. Thank you.